from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. James Madison today. He's Gary Rosen, the managing editor of Commentary and formerly senior editor of the Manhattan Institute's uh, excellent City Journal. Gary's book on Madison is called American Compact, James Madison and the Problem of Founding, which came out uh, two years ago and is based upon his dissertation at Harvard. The American Historical Review recently called uh, Gary's book the place to start for the serious student of Madison's political thought. Pretty good for one's first book uh, in the Madisonian uh, uh, corpus. Uh, Gary's written many political articles for commentary for the Wall Street Journal uh, and for uh, uh, other publications. And his uh, remarks today are going to address the question, was Madison an original thinker? If the answer is not yes, we may have been wasting our time for the, the entire symposium, although one could say that originality is perhaps overpraised as a virtue or as a characteristic. It's easy to be original if you're wrong. Uh, there are many more ways to, be, to go wrong than there are to go right, after all. And um, I used to say sometimes that um, in, in uh, criticism of modern liberalism, that uh, liberalism really has not had an original idea in 100 years which I think is true, basically. All the great works about modern liberalism came out in the progressive period or shortly thereafter. Uh, and I meant that as criticism. Conservatism, modern conservatism, by contrast, uh, I find more palatable because it hasn't had an original idea in about 2,500 years. Uh, Gary Rosen, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Charles. It's uh, really a very great pleasure to be here today, I, uh, in working on my book, spent many, many happy hours in the magnificent reading room in this building. And on occasion, I would go across the street to the other library building and have a chat uh, with Mr. Madison. There's a big statue there. He, he was always very good company. Um, in any event, it's a great honor to be here with you uh, this afternoon. Every academic field has its schemes of classification and scholarship on the American founding is no different. As a result, James Madison, like the other leading figures of his generation, is often placed in one or another ideological box. It is said that he is a liberal or a Republican, a nationalist or an advocate of states' rights, a follower of what scholars call the court party or perhaps of its country rival. Such labels are helpful and necessary in their way, and I've gladly used them myself on many occasions, but taxonomies of this sort seldom do justice to individuals. And this is especially true, I think, when dealing with a thinker of James Madison's sophistication. Madison, I would suggest, was more than just a supremely capable politician and legislator. He was a self-consciously philosophical statesman one who freely related the issues of his day to a wider theory of politics. In particular, Madison was a profoundly original thinker with respect to the root idea of his political thought, the social compact. An attentive reader of Madison's writings cannot help noticing his constant resort to the idea of the social compact. Its distinctive terms, notions like the state of nature and natural rights, flow through virtually every one of his discussions of political fundamentals, from his earliest days in the Continental Congress to his years of retirement at Montpelier. But Madison, I would argue, was no mere follower of the philosophers who originally developed this idea. In the time we have here this afternoon, I want to suggest how truly innovative, Charles, innovative, Madison was in his own thinking about the social compact especially as it relates to the Federal Convention of 1787 and the actual making of the U.S. Constitution. Madison's distinctive view of the social compact is also very useful, I'd suggest, for making sense of the American political scene after the Constitution was established. In particular, it points to the serious differences that separated Madison not only from Alexander Hamilton, but also from his great friend, Thomas Jefferson, the two men whose rivalry is usually thought to define the politics 
of the early republic. So, to start at the beginning, what is the social compact, or as it is sometimes called, the social contract? It is a very familiar idea, of course, so familiar, in fact, that it is easy to forget just how radical it was when it was first introduced in the 17th century by the English philosophers Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Basically, the social compact is an idea about the origins of government, about what makes a government legitimate. For most of human history, those governments that have bothered to justify themselves have pointed to the will of God or to the extraordinary qualities of a certain class or more generally just to a tradition of some sort. Under the social compact, by contrast, government is seen as the direct creation of the people as a whole, as an instrument or tool for securing their safety and well-being. In America, the best known formulation of this idea can be found, of course, in the Declaration of Independence. In order to secure our inalienable rights, Jefferson wrote, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Yet, as Jefferson continued, and here's the key part, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Now, this is pretty radical stuff, particularly if you think about it in the context of its day. What it involves, above all, is a profound notion of human equality. It gives to everyone, to every member of society in principle, a say in what the basic structure of government should look like. The original purpose of this idea, especially in the writings of John Locke, was to keep existing political institutions in line to remind kings and aristocrats that they had to attend to the public good. Its message was simple, serve the people or get replaced by the people. But America's situation was very different from that of 17th century England. Rather than just needing to keep old institutions in line, the newly independent Americans needed to start from scratch to build entirely new political institutions. And here was the rub. For it may have been self-evident that they had the right to make new governments, but it was far from self-evident just how they were supposed to go about doing it. Who exactly would do the Constitution making? This is where James Madison comes in, and where we begin to see, I would suggest, his profound originality as a political thinker. Now, as you may remember, Madison was one of the youngest members of the founding generation. He wasn't yet on the scene in 1776 when Jefferson was writing the Declaration of Independence. His national debut came later in 1780 when he first joined the Virginia delegation in the Continental Congress. It was around this time that the states ratified the Articles of Confederation, the first American constitution. The Confederation was a hopelessly ineffective national government primarily as a result of its organizing principle, which was to treat all the states equally, almost as fully sovereign nations. Each state had just one vote in the Continental Congress, and unanimity was required for any change in the Articles themselves. Needless to say, laws passed by the Continental Congress, and particularly its requisitions for funds, were widely ignored. For three years, Madison worked to reform the Confederation, especially to win for it an independent source of revenue. But his proposals were rejected one after another, usually the victim of the article's requirement of unanimity. Late in 1783, having completed his term as a delegate, he returned to Virginia, deeply troubled by the worsening national situation. It is at this point that Madison began his most serious reflections on the problems of the Union. How, he wondered, as I wipe sweat from my brow, would it be possible to form a more effective national government? He knew that any new government would have to be ratified by the people. But could the plan for a new government actually come from the people? 
Could they be counted on to know what the nation needed and what sort of institutions were required to achieve it? Madison was very doubtful, in large part because of his own experience trying to add a few modest powers to the Articles of Confederation. When it came to the still grander project of an entirely new constitution, the people he believed were simply lacking in the necessary political know-how or prudence. Worse, according to Madison, the people were too indifferent to the welfare of the nation as a whole. Their most powerful political passions were tied to the sovereign claims of the individual state governments and to their own narrow economic interests. These passions gave rise to what Madison in Federalist 10 famously called the problem of faction. Faction, as he saw it, was the primary obstacle to creating an adequate constitution. If the nation's political situation was to be resolved, Madison came to believe, it would require extraordinary means. It would require, he concluded, a constitutional convention. Now, today, we tend to view a constitutional convention as a very matter-of-fact thing, the obvious solution to getting rid of one government and launching another. But such conventions were a political innovation of the highest order. They represent America's chief contribution, at least in practical terms, to the idea of the social compact. After all, you can't literally bring all the people together to make a government. It would be wildly impractical, an administrative impossibility. So, you come up with an alternative, a gathering of representatives specially empowered to express the people's will. Like many other American statesmen of the day, Madison recognized these advantages, but he also came to see conventions as far more than a convenient substitute for the people as a whole. To his mind, they also provided an opportunity to circumvent the people, even if just temporarily. Indeed, Madison eventually concluded that constitutional conventions were a necessary device for allowing, allowing those like himself, those whom he called the most enlightened and influential patriots, to escape from the hold of democratic institutions. The example to follow, he suggests in Federalist 38, was that of ancient lawgivers like Solon and Lycurgus, men of preeminent wisdom and approved integrity, who nonetheless were compelled to act outside the bounds of regular authority. Paradoxical as it may sound, Madison seems to have concluded that America would get a sound Republican constitution only by means of an aristocratic coup of sorts. In this regard, it is important to remember the somewhat irregular circumstances surrounding the Federal Convention of 1787. It wasn't the states themselves or the Continental Congress that issued the original call for delegates to meet in Philadelphia. Rather, the call came forth from a small gathering known as the Annapolis Convention, which took place in 1786 and was supposed to be confined to recommending better ways for regulating commerce. But Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and the other notables who attended this small meeting decided to do more. Rather than address the narrow question of commercial regulation, they instead called upon the states to send delegates to a still grander convention. This next convention, of course, met in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. We tend to forget that the Federal Convention, like the Annapolis Convention before it, was assigned a limited purpose, and that the Constitution it produced was an unwelcome surprise to much of the nation. The delegates had been asked to figure out a way to strengthen the Union, but it was assumed that they would preserve the basic form of the Articles of Confederation, that is, the principle that all the states were equal and that each would have just one vote in deciding national policy. In the end, however, the delegates to the Federal Convention did not even pretend to be amending the Articles. They promulgated a brand new Constitution and asked for it to be ratified not by the state legislatures, as the Articles required, but by the people themselves. Most scandalous of all, they proclaimed that the approval of just nine states, instead of the unanimity required by the Articles, would be sufficient to ratify the new Constitution. 
two centuries later, it is hard to appreciate just how outrageous an assumption of authority this was. But many Americans were indignant at the time. As they saw it, a duly established national government, the Confederation, had been discarded without a second thought. For his part, Madison did not mince words in Philadelphia when it came to whether the delegates should respect the limits imposed on them by the Confederation and the state governments. As he put it, and I quote, we ought to consider what is right and necessary in itself for the attainment of a proper government. A plan adjusted to this idea will recommend itself. All the most enlightened and respectable citizens will be its advocates. Should we fall short of the necessary and proper point, this influential class of citizens will be turned against the plan, and little support in opposition to them can be gained from the unreflecting multitude. Madison, in short, was uninterested in the immediate views of the American people themselves. This unreflecting multitude, as he called them, would simply follow the opinions of the country's leading men. Nor did Madison change his mind in the wake of the convention. While the ratification debate was going on in 1788, he received a letter from his fellow Virginian, Edmund Randolph. Randolph was sympathetic to the calls that were then being heard for a second constitutional convention, one that would be more open about its aims and more fully informed by the views of the people. In response, Madison did not hesitate to repeat his impolitic views. There can be no doubt, he wrote to Randolph, that there are subjects to which the bulk of mankind are unequal and on which they must and will be governed by those with whom they happen to have acquaintance and confidence. The proposed constitution is of this description. Now, in describing Madison's doubts about popular constitution making, I do not mean to paint him as some kind of anti-democratic ogre. However little the people might contribute to the actual design of the Constitution, he was determined to see it popularly ratified. Only the people's consent, he believed, could give legitimacy to the Constitution and ensure the people's devotion to maintaining and defending it. I should also emphasize that Madison was a firm and principled believer in the cause of popular government. Just a week after sharing his impolitic views with Edmund Randolph, he published Federalist 39, where he proudly insisted that the new Constitution was, as he put it, strictly Republican. In fact, Madison's elitist view of founding was very much tied to his hopes as a partisan of Republicanism. Only by putting the task of Constitution making into the hands of a prudent few, he seemed to believe, could government be made commensurate to the abilities of the many, the people. Madison saw that there was something naive or perhaps evasive in how Hobbes and Locke had originally described the social compact. In their eagerness to establish the principle of equality, they had glossed over certain abiding inequalities. As a result, their account of government's origin said nothing about how a constitution in all its institutional complexity might actually be established. They seem to assume that the simple fact of popular sovereignty would lead spontaneously to lasting governments. Madison's great contribution was to recognize that the people required a good deal of help in this task. As he saw it, the, the essential lesson of 1787 was that popular sovereignty had to be limited if it was not to destroy the possibility of stable, moderate, Republican government. Now, as I suggested at the start, Madison's insights into the social compact are not just of interest when it comes to the founding itself. As it turns out, Madison's distinctively American compact, as I call it in the title of my book, also adds a new dimension to our understanding of the politics of the early republic, especially the crucial period of the 1790s. In most accounts of this period, Madison is treated as a secondary figure. Once the Constitution was established, we are told, he simply faded into the partisan background, adding little of originality to the bitter dispute between Federalists and Republicans. 
As one historian puts it, during these years, and I quote, Madison's thought moves between the boundaries drawn by Hamilton and Jefferson. He was between them. He was a consummate trimmer. I believe this view is mistaken and that it overlooks the principal differences that Madison had not only with Hamilton, but also, if to a lesser extent, with Jefferson. These differences, moreover, have a lot to do, I would argue, with Madison's peculiar understanding of the social compact. For Madison, as I have suggested, the Federal Convention was able to do its work because of two opposing sorts of political claims. On the one hand, and in keeping with the orthodox view of the social compact, there was the people's natural right to create a government that would better serve their needs. On the other hand, and more unique to Madison, there was the idea that in order to pull off this task, the people very much needed the help of aristocratically minded gentlemen. For Madison, it was the careful combination of these two sets of claims that had made the Constitution possible. His differences with Jefferson and Hamilton, I would contend, stem in part from his belief that each of them represented a dangerous reversion to one side of this founding equation, and that each, in his way, was a threat to the country's new and still fragile constitutional order. Jefferson, of course, represented the popular side of the equation. Like Madison, he wanted the people to take a proprietary interest in their constitution to see the government under which they lived as a thing of their own making, dependent on their jealous vigilance. Unlike Madison, however, Jefferson believed that this sentiment could be produced only by the people's direct participation in the act of founding. As Jefferson saw it, this recurrence to first principle, to the original authority of the people, had to take place often, preferably within the political experience of every citizen. The most radical of Jefferson's many proposals on this question is contained in a famous letter that he wrote to Madison in 1789 as Jefferson was preparing to return after four years as American ambassador to France. This is the letter that Drew McCoy alluded to in opening his uh, remarks. Jefferson asked, and I quote, whether one generation of men has a right to bind another. His answer, and it represents a perfectly respectable view of the social compact, was a resounding no, they couldn't. Indeed, Jefferson concluded that all public laws, including constitutions, simply expired with the passing of the generation that established them. By his own calculations, this took place every 19 years. Thus, the constitution that Madison and the others had just labored with so much difficulty to establish would lose all legitimacy, he suggested, in less than two decades, and the people would be obliged to start over again. For Jefferson, the social compact required nothing less than a process of perpetual refounding. In response to Jefferson's various schemes over the years, Madison always made roughly the same reply. First, of course, being both a good friend and a savvy politician, Madison was always quick to congratulate Jefferson for his originality and brilliance. From here, however, Madison would raise a range of practical objections. He suggested, for instance, that if ordinary laws simply lapsed every 19 years, useful things like paying off the national debt and owning property might become a little tricky. Madison's most serious response, however, was that the Constitution itself simply could not withstand such regular recourse to the sovereign authority of the people. As he wrote in Federalist 49, in perhaps the most eloquent of his replies to Jefferson, and I quote, every appeal to the people would carry an implication of some defect in the government. Frequent appeals would in great measure deprive the government of that veneration, a key idea for Madison, that veneration which time bestows on everything and without which perhaps the wisest and freest governments would not possess the requisite stability. Madison fully expected the people to exert their rightful influence, but he wanted them to do so through their elected representatives and in the last resort through the amendment power set out in the Constitution itself. 
What he feared and saw as antithetical to the actual experience of the American founding was any effort to reproduce in all its breadth the awesome political, the awesome popular authority, the sovereign authority described by the traditional social compact. In Madison's view, Jefferson not only overestimated the abilities of the people, but he failed to appreciate just how difficult it had been to create a single sound constitution, much less an ongoing series of them. If Jefferson erred on the side of the people, Hamilton, by contrast, was too ready to accommodate the claims of the aristocratic few. As we have seen, the great innovation of Madison's social compact was to assign a key role to those whom he called the most enlightened and influential patriots. These were the men, including, of course, Madison and Hamilton themselves, who essentially did for the people what they were incapable of doing for themselves. They made a constitution. But what would happen to this division between the many and the few once the Constitution was established? Would the aristocratic gentlemen who dominated the Federal Convention dominate the new government as well? And would they exercise the same degree of latitude? The dispute between Hamilton and Madison that emerged in the early 1790s is usually thought to hinge on the question of how the Constitution's enumerated powers should be interpreted. The standard view is that Hamilton, while promoting his ambitious financial program, sought to exploit every possible implication of these powers, while Madison insisted on a stricter, more literal reading. I would suggest that the issue is better understood if framed in a broader way. Ultimately, I believe, the difference between Madison and Hamilton concerned not the degree to which the Constitution's enumerated powers should limit the government, but whether they should at all. Here we must stop for a moment to consider where Hamilton himself stood on these matters. In his view of constitutional interpretation, we see, I think, two distinct stages. The first coincides with his promotion in 1791 of a bill to establish the first bank of the United States. Hamilton did not pretend that the power of incorporation, the specific power needed to form a national bank, was among those listed in the Constitution. Instead, he called it an implied power. It was, he argued, a necessary instrument for carrying into effect powers that were indisputably granted to the national government. Hamilton soon recognized, however, that the, broader, that the broad construction of specified powers would only take him so far. It might be enough to provide constitutional cover for the Bank of the United States but it would not give him the authority he needed to implement his wider agenda. A few months after the debate over the bank bill, we thus see a second stage in Hamilton's approach to constitutional interpretation. Here, the key text is his famous report on manufactures. On this occasion, the question was whether Congress had the authority to establish bounties for encouraging particular industries, again, a power not found in the Constitution. This time, however, Hamilton took a different and more radical tack. Invoking the Constitution's references to promoting the country's general welfare, he declared that Congress had the authority not just to decide what powers were available to it, as he had maintained in the dispute over the bank, but indeed what the very purposes of the national government should be. Madison had a number of important objections to this mode of interpreting the Constitution. As he pointed out, if Hamilton was right, it was hard to explain why the Constitution even bothered to describe specific enumerated powers. More fundamentally, Madison argued that the sort of activism in constitutional interpretation practiced by Hamilton would confirm the worst fears of the Constitution's opponents. After all, advocates of the new government had maintained that there was no need for a Bill of Rights because, as Madison reminded the members of Congress, and I quote, powers not given by the Constitution were said to be retained by the people, and those given were not to be extended by remote implications. As Madison emphasized, this was certainly the belief that had prevailed in the state ratifying conventions, held just three years earlier. 
In fact, the idea of enumerated and strictly delegated federal powers was the foundation of what would become the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, which Congress itself had recently proposed for ratification. Now, Madison argued, the Congress was giving serious thought to overthrowing these common understandings. Drawing a parallel to the Federal Convention of 1787, and here I think we see the broader principles at stake, Madison suggested that the bank bill was an attempt to extend the process of constitution making beyond its legitimate term. As he observed to his colleagues, and I quote, with all this evidence of the sense in which the Constitution was understood and adopted, will it not be said that the Constitution's adoption was brought by one set of arguments and that it is now administered under the influence of another set? This reproach will have the keener sting, Madison continued, because it is applicable to so many individuals who have been concerned in both the adoption of the Constitution and now in its administration. When Hamilton finally endorsed the view that the only meaningful limit on national power was some vague notion of the general welfare, Madison had had enough. To him, Hamilton's intentions were now clear. The Secretary of the Treasury wanted something like an ongoing constitutional convention, a government in which the outstanding few could pursue the public good as they saw fit. Though Madison himself could be blamed in part for the precedent that had inspired Hamilton, he never showed the same aristocratic inclination. For Madison, the Federal Convention had been a unique event, not an example of how the nation should be governed. The people he knew were not up to the task of founding, but once given a sound constitution, he believed, they were certainly capable of self-government. Today, it is important to recognize just how much we take Madison's reconceived and Americanized social compact for granted. Madison knew that the social compact of Hobbes and Locke and of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence could no longer be treated as a thought experiment. Its basic principles were so widely accepted at the time of the American Revolution that they had become a template for practical politics not least for the creation of new governments. Of course, when the people of America broke away from Great Britain, they did not exactly think of themselves as occupying a state of nature, but they did expect to make governments much as natural men would. Because the American people were incapable of doing this on their own, we have founding fathers. Because they nonetheless were able to retain their sovereign pride, we have American patriotism. Madison's great achievement was to explain how these disparate elements could come together and to play no small part in seeing that they did. Thank you. And questions? Sir. Um, the Articles of Confederation had allowed uh, the Congress to uh, charge the common treasury anything to provide for the common defense and general welfare. And in fact, under that uh, provision, um, in 1781, they had approved a bank, the uh, National uh, uh, Bank of North America. And uh, Madison had voted against that the first time around on programmatic reasons and then um, acquiesced. Um, the, the first action of the convention was to provide that the new government would have all of the powers of Congress under the Articles of Confederation plus some more. And I would think that that would have carried over the bank power as a matter of uh, course. And in fact, uh, when they adopted uh, Clause 1, the first enumerated uh, power, they adopted it right from that same language as to provide for the common defense and uh, general welfare. Noah Webster uh, tells people it's a, a enumerated power, so I, if they go beyond defense of, uh, beyond the common defense and general welfare, then that would be a, a usurpation. I wonder uh, if, therefore, um, Hamilton doesn't have the better of the law. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, Madison is not happy about it, but the established yeah. precedent. Now, of course, the Articles of Confederation, you had to have nine out of 13 states approve of a, something for the uh, general welfare, and in fact, there 
uh, grand change of the Constitution is that simple majority will allow anything from the general welfare. But you act as if uh, general welfare is the usurpation when it seems to have been yeah. long-standing ordinary application, not much used because of the supermajority rule. But um, nonetheless, that was yeah. Our no, I do think I do actually text. think it is a um, it is not something that you can derive on legitimate, uh, on legitimate uh, reading of the Constitution, additional powers from. I think um, in, the, in the first place, it, it, uh, it makes the specific enumeration uh, pointless. If, if you basically, if you, if you basically are saying the Congress may do whatever it sees fit to pursue the public good, all you really need to do is establish institutionally this tripartite government with uh, terms of appointment, election, and whatnot, and off they go their merry way. So, I mean, I think in the, in the first place, it, it does make it difficult to explain the rest of the Constitution in all of its specificity. But beyond that, too, and I think Madison is right about this, as difficult as it was to get the Constitution ratified um, uh, as things stood, if those who had uh, proposed the Constitution were its advocates had suggested this as a mode of constitutional interpretation, it almost certainly would have been defeated. So in Madison's mind, I think that the meaning of the Constitution and the legitimate way of interpreting it was set uh, in large part by the understandings that prevailed at the time of ratification, and that, um, that if, if you had had this Hamiltonian principle out there uh, brooding about, that uh, it almost certainly would not have been ratified. But that's uh, counterfactual history. Question. Did, um Madison think of this as a self-sustaining uh, framework once this uh, uh, extraordinary combination yeah. of uh, extraordinary individuals and the people met? Yeah. Um, and if so, um, or rather, if that wasn't the case, what provision did he make to uh, uh, ensure that at future junctures, um, crises, uh, this uh, extraordinary combination of an enlightened few, and the people would, and the people would again uh, make the Constitution, or at least amend the Constitution in a way that would meet the demands of the time. Yeah, um, I mean, there was an allusion earlier today uh, to the idea that. Uh, that the Constitution was this machine once established that would uh, run uh, by itself. And the allusion is often to the kind of uh, mechanistic physical science of the day. And I don't think that was Madison's view, that somehow once you um, have these uh, aristocratic gentlemen give you this uh, setup that uh, you can turn it over to the people and, uh, and, uh, and uh, whatever vices, interests, passions they bring, it will all work out in the end. I think a very important part of his thought, and this is something that I try to explore in my book, which I didn't really talk about here, you know, gets to this idea of his uh, republicanism and how it too might be associated in important ways with his ideas about the social compact. We tend to think about republicanism, and uh, Drew McCoy uh, spoke uh, in passing about it today, as, uh, as something that has to come from before our uh, modern political thought, before uh, Locke and Hobbes and uh, these other people we talk about as being strong influences. So we tend to call it neoclassical, and we talk about the Romans and the Greeks and whatnot. And um, certainly these were important models for Madison and the others, but I don't think we should overlook the resources within modern political thought to generate republican sentiments. I think for Madison, it was uh, very important, um, however incomplete it was, that uh, there was this fundamental idea that constitutions were made by the people, that they created them, and that they would, because of that, have this kind of proud attachment to them. Um, in a way, he's a very interesting reversal of what happens in these older ideas of the social compact that you find in Locke and Hobbes. Uh, Locke and Hobbes give you these very general descriptions of how a frame of government will come about. You have the state of nature, and uh, everyone comes together in some unspecified way and makes a frame of government. Um, for them, that frame of government um, wasn't anything we would recognize as uh, Republican, Democratic, uh, what have you. There was an admixture of monarchy, aristocracy, what have you. Um, so in their view, the only really fully democratic or popular moment was the making of government. And then after that, um, it would be restricted in some way. Um, Madison, in a sense, I think, turns the whole thing around. 
And he says that um, you can't really begin to make a government in some popular or democratic way. But if you can, uh, and if you are fortunate enough to uh, bring together these necessary elements of a moderate regime, you can hope to make it a Republican government that doesn't depend ultimately on uh, this kind of extraordinary intervention of uh, the aristocratic few. Uh, Gary, can yeah. I ask you this question? Uh, do you think Madison wrote Federalist Number 40, in which he works out the justification of the convention and the defense against the illegality? Did he write that, do you think, in response to a particular anti-Federalist writers who had suddenly started to harp on that issue? Yeah. Uh, do you know anything about that? I don't, I don't remember clearly enough from my readings of the anti-Federalist who it was that was uh, pressing these sorts of claims. I think Luther Martin, among others, was very upset that the Articles of Confederation had essentially just been set aside, that its provisions had been ignored and they had started all over again, really. But I, I, don't, think, I don't think this was some uh, kind of minority view. I think it was a consensus of sorts that the convention had um, done something a little fishy, had acted under irregular authority. It was just a question of how serious that violation was and what conclusions you should draw from it. Um, but I, I don't know specifically uh, which writer Federalist 40 might be a response to. Um, Gary, uh, just to press you a little bit, and maybe I misunderstood you, so I'll let you uh, clear up. This I was point. probably unclear, Dennis. So uh, well, ahead. you titled your paper uh, Madison as an original thinker, and then and you referred to, I thought, the Declaration of Independence as in some way in line with Hobbes and Locke and the Declaration, mm -hmm. and you drew a distinction between Madison's thought and Jefferson's thought. So are you arguing that that Madison has an understanding of the Declaration that suggests that the Declaration is somehow defective, that its political theory is defective, yeah. or is it simply a different interpretation of the same document? No, I think, and this gets to what I was saying about Jefferson, um, and um, yeah, and in, a, and in a way, and in this respect, perhaps this uh, respect alone, it is useful, I think, to uh, set Jefferson's very brief and rhetorical uh, description of the social compact and the Declaration of Independence alongside the much more fully developed ideas of the social compact that you find in Locke and Hobbes, in that um, it, it does just suggest in, in, a, in a somewhat naive way that government is matter-of-factly made by uh, the people um, acting in concert, acting together. Um, there is in the Federalist paper uh, a point at which uh, Madison um, quotes the Declaration of Independence. This is something uh, Charles has uh, written about as well. And uh, it's very interesting because he quotes it selectively. Um, he, um, he takes out this important phrase uh, in the middle here. Here, let me see. Do I have this somewhere? I'm not going to find it. Uh, but uh, he, he takes out the phrase that most explicitly says the people will lay these foundations on the terms that seem best to them. Uh, there's no ellipse. There's no note uh, saying that he's done this. And um, I find that very interesting. Uh, how much significance you want to attach to it, I don't know. Maybe it was just an oversight in the rush to get that Federalist paper to press. But I think more fundamentally, it can be seen as a quiet dissent from Jefferson. In, in Jefferson's um, attempt in 1783, or the 1783 draft for the Virginia Constitution, he included a, a section on ratification Later, um, Madison gives comments, or looks at it during the, the mid-80s and passes those along to somebody else on 87. I don't remember if he checked, if he, he dealt with the section on ratification. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Boy, I don't, I don't remember exactly what you're uh, talking about here. I mean, um, Jefferson and Madison were both very concerned to uh, get a new constitution for Virginia. Virginia, like so many of the other states, like all of the other states, of course, upon independence, had to create a frame of government and put it on a certain uh, footing. Um, they had to decide uh, how powers would be divided and whatnot. Many, uh, most of the newly independent states had constitutional conventions, formal gatherings whose express purpose was to make a form of government. And uh, the delegates to those 
gatherings were elected specifically for that. Virginia, by contrast, uh, just had the legislature, the assembly, uh, promulgate a constitution. Uh, they hadn't been voted into office for that purpose. They didn't pretend any special authority. And what it amounted to was the uh, legislature created a constitution under which the legislature was enormously powerful and was unchecked by any uh, executive or judicial power. Uh, Madison and Jefferson thought that this constitution was flawed structurally, but more important than that, and this again gets to this fundamental idea that they shared, um, they thought it was in important ways illegitimate that it hadn't been established as a constitution must be established um, with, um, with delegates who are expressing in some way uh, the, people's, uh, the people's wishes. Now, this sounds different from what I'm describing uh, as uh, Madison's view of how the constitution, uh, the American constitution was made some years later. I think this would be three or four years later. And I think you can see in his thought, and I try to describe in my book this change in his thought, um, a growing skepticism about the possibility of really following through with this strict interpretation in a way of how um, constitutions must be made. Um, he, he ends up substituting in the end this idea that a constitutional convention must reflect in some fairly direct way the views of the people to um, this notion, which is not incidental, of after the fact ratification. And, and that's, that's a real change. Yes. Gary, um, have you traced out any lines of connection between Madison and John Adams' thought about oh boy. ratification convention? I mean, have, have, you, have you done that? Forgive me. No, I haven't. Uh, tell me um, Adams' what? thought on this. And well, I, no, I can't give it in detail, but I understood that in his collection of yeah. constitutions and his writing about how you might, about the ratification process, he in fact imagined something closer to the ratification process before anybody else. Yeah. I'm sure that's true. I, I just don't know. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.